Hi guys, Pastor Matt Chandler here. Pray uh, that this sermon, this resource, uh, be used by God in conjunction with you belonging to a local church uh, to grow you and sanctify you in your faith. If these resources bless you, would you consider giving back to us here at TBC? You can do that either through the app or you can go online to TBC Resources uh, and give there. Again, pray that this blesses you and grows you in your love for Jesus Christ. Well, good morning. How are we? It's good to see you, and I mean that literally. Uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab those. It's cute. I'm actually going to read from my Bible this morning instead of my iPad. First time in like six months. But if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab those. We're going to be in James chapter one. Didn't realize it was so easy to get applause out of you. Um, listen, I realized this last week. Um, I, I, by the grace of God, get to travel some and get to preach in uh, other places and um, man, I was in a really, really beautiful part of the earth uh, last weekend. I was in Aspen, Colorado, so get the Dumb and Dumber quotes out of your head uh, real quick. And, um, and, and so here we are in this really beautiful place, this really beautiful church, and I just kept finding my mind drifting to wonder how JT was going, doing, wonder what's going on back home. Yeah, I listened. He, he did incredible. And, uh, and so it, it really is a, a unique thing uh, for, for me um, to feel so knitted to you, uh, so that I'm in Aspen, I'm at this great little church in Aspen, and God's doing these incredible things, and I'm just wondering how things are going. I'm wondering what God is up to. I'm wondering about some of you as individuals and, and more, uh, more uh, us corporately, how God continues to shape and mold and what God's up to. And so uh, I say all that to say uh, it's good to be home. So uh, this is week four uh, of our current series, and so let me, let me try to catch you up as quickly as I know how. Um, the, the Village Church is not far from its own autonomy, uh, which means we will be a local church, yet again, a single location. So campuses are uh, spinning off. In fact, the majority of our larger campuses are gone. Uh, and so now what does it mean uh, to be uh, the Village Church, a church with a global reach in, in this little part of Dallas-Fort Worth? Like, like, what does it mean for us? And so building upon uh, the last 17 years, we just rolled out uh, a new uh, mission statement. That mission statement's really simple. It just is built off of the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. And it just says, we exist to love God and love people and make disciples of Jesus Christ. So, it, so it's that simple. And so week one, we rolled that out and we just said, what would it look like uh, for us to embrace this and embody this? What would it look like for us to turn and say, I'm going to order my life around a growing affection for Jesus Christ, right? That, that's how I'm going to order my life. Like I'm going to consider my time. I'm going to consider my money. I'm going to consider my relationships. I'm going to consider uh, the places that I play and everything's going to serve a singular purpose. And that singular purpose is a growing affection for Jesus Christ. And then week two, we said, hey, some things are going to have to happen uh, if we're going to really not only embrace this, but begin to embody this so that when people think about us, what they think is that that person loves Jesus Christ. That's who they are. Uh, I find them a little strange, certainly a little quirky, but here's what I can say. They are really, really, really caught up in this Jesus thing, right? Not a political party, not a moral position, but the person and work of Jesus Christ. So we embrace and we embody and we said, okay, what, 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 then, uh, what, then must me, what, what then must we try to lean into if God will bring this to fruition? And so we said, we're going to have to receive God's grace. We must not ever move off the gospel, Amen. ever right? There's not another drumbeat that we'll ever make here. We are a gospel-formed people, a gospel-informed people, a gospel-shaped people. We never want to move off of it. And although our emphasis on part of the spectrum of the gospel in any given moment might change, we're always going to beat the drumbeat of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation, right? For the Jews first and then the Gentiles. That, that's not me, that's the Bible. And, um, and then we said we're going to have to embrace our calling. L listen, more and more and more we're going to get serious about God's call on your life. 
Um, I, I, I don't want us to have a staff of 170 people. You know why? Because we've got a church of 4,000. So why do I need a staff of 170? God's got a call on your life. He's uniquely gifted you. He, he, like you can teach, you can lead, you can disciple. You can, I know it because this is what you're doing in your workplace. Like where else do you hit cruise control? So I'm asking you not to hit cruise control, but, but where we're going to focus our energy is in helping you grow in your knowledge of your gifting and then unleashing you to use that gift in the body. You're going to have to embrace your calling. God's got a call on your life. It's not on me. It's on us. Right? And then lastly, we're going to have to just pray for faith. And we talked about uh, the complexities of the day and the doubt and skepticism that's just part of the day in which we live. Uh, and so these are called plausibility structures. There's a reason that, that we tend to be cynical at first. Right? That's not how a lot of the world operates. That's predominantly how the Western world operates. And so we're going to have to pray for faith. We're going to have to lean into our doubts. We're going to have to lean into our fears. And then um, we, we, from there, um, moved and started to pull phrases out of the Great Commandment and Great Commission to show you where we're building all of this upon. Right? This wasn't kind of a think tank idea. That This was wrung from the scriptures. And so JT last week talked about holistic disciples and what it means to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. Uh, and that, man, we've got our bents, Right? Uh, and, and that we need one another to grow into all that God has for us. And so I loved his, his admonition is if you're like, uh, if you're really kind of a, a feel hard, uh, that, man, you probably need to get around some people that, that are more mind. And, and then if many of you are like hardcore mind, as terrifying as it might be, you might need to get around someone who is a bit more heart and soul and that we shape one another and we need one another to that end. And so I just thought he did, did an excellent job. And then it, it falls on me now. Um, to take the qualifier around love your neighbor. And, and so it, it's a strange qualifier. So you would think, okay, we got that. Holistic disciples, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength. Now, tell us about how to love our neighbor. Well, I can't because of the qualifier. So the qualifier is love your neighbor as what? Yourself. Self-love? What? So I want to spend my time with you today talking about knowledge and love of self. Now, uh, before we dive in, I, I wanted to, to quote this. This is John Calvin. Everybody breathe. Calvin's your friend. And, and here's what John Calvin said, first sentence in his work, The Institutes. Our wisdom, insofar as it ought to be deemed true and solid wisdom, consists almost entirely of two parts— the knowledge of God and of ourselves. And so Calvin says, if there's any true wisdom, if there's anything that you ought to build upon, if there's, if there's anything that should be shaping you, it's twofold. It's the knowledge of God and the knowledge of self. And so we covered last week knowledge of God, and now I want to dive into knowledge of self. Now, it's important to note that Calvin didn't pull this out of thin air. It's actually wrung from the text that we've been in these four weeks, Matthew 22, 37 through 40. I'm going to put it back on the screen. You stay there in James 1. That will be our primary passage today. And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your mind, and this is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Do you see, like even Calvin's pulling from this passage here, where, where is Jesus saying all the law, all the prophets can be found in loving the Lord your God and loving your neighbor as yourself. And so I don't think I have an easy task here today, and I'll tell you why. The thrust of the New Testament is not love yourself, it's deny yourself and die to yourself. The thrust of the New Testament isn't self-esteem, right? And I remember, like, this shift happened, like, um, real talk. Uh, I did the eighth grade twice. Did the eighth grade twice, Right? And that's because when I was there, they, weren't care, they didn't care much uh, about how I saw myself and what that might do to me. And oh my gosh, my whole life might be wrecked if I was too dumb to pass the eighth grade. <laughs> I'm not trying to rant on where we are. I'm just saying, like, this is kind of a brand new thing in human history where we're all just a bunch of strawberries. You better not handle it too rough or you'll crush the thing. 
And so the Bible's not about your self-esteem. It's not about my self-esteem. The thrust of the New Testament is you die to yourself. You deny yourself. It's the thrust of the Christian life. And I've argued for over a decade, it's the best news in the universe. Like when Jesus is talking about following him, right? He uses this radical language of deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. He says crazy stuff like anyone who loves his life will lose it. But anyone who hates his life will find it. Like, like, look, that's not selling products in 2020. It's just not. This is the thrust of the New Testament. In fact, not just following Jesus, but even kind of lifestyle and what it means to interact with other people are formed on this idea of self-denial and dying to self. Colossians 3, 5 through 10. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of his creator. Do you hear it? Deny yourself. You have sexually impure compulsions. Deny yourself. You have a tendency to lie, you deny yourself. You have a tendency to slander and gossip, deny yourself. You, you tend to uh, covet and wish you had a different life, deny yourself. Right? This is the, th- the 54 one another's in the New Testament are all about self denial. Love one another, serve one another, outdo one another in honor, greet one another, don't lie to one another. 54 of them. What do they do? They shape how we're to interact with one another, and all of it is about self denial. So you don't show up at church and go, somebody better one another me. You, you show up and you go, I'm going to outdo in honor. I'm going to love. I'm going to encourage. I'm going to, right? You, you step into the life God has for you via self-denial. So then what are we to make of this? What do we do with this love yourself idea? Somehow the qualifier on how we love our neighbor is dependent on how we love ourselves. So all of this self-denial and dying to self can't be self-hate. It has to be something else. So the Bible and all this self-denial isn't saying, hate yourself, even when it says, if a man would uh, hate his life, he would find it. It's not about self-hate. It's not about, even, even though I love the Puritans, it's not about, I'm a worm. It's not, it's not about that. So, so let's, let's talk about self. Um, you Look right at me. You are a unique you. You have a self. You, you have a self. You are completely unique among every other human being on earth. You and only you are you. Now, psychology, I'll I'll mix up psychology's words with, with our words. According to psychology, and this is way oversimplified, Our self is made up of our God-given schemas. So psychology wouldn't say God-given schemas, right? Uh, I'm saying that. Our God-given schemas, which means you you have a way in which you are when you were born. The Bible tells us a lot about that, but more on that, I want to give away the surprise at the end. And then you have experienced some things. And in who you are, in God's wiring of you, the result of the fall, mingled with your experiences, fears, and anxieties, creates you-ness. And you are you, and there's only one of you. So you do have a self, okay? So, so you do have a self. Now, um, the way that we kind of interact with ourselves is like this. Many of us avoid ourself, right? Our, our true self, that, that thing, that deepest part, like we avoid that. We don't like that. And again, that, that goes back to a lot of different things, whether that be experiences or, or home of origin or, or whatever. We, we avoid ourselves. We, we don't like it. And then uh, another way you handle the self uh, is you adapt yourself, Right, So I don't like me, but I can read the time in which I live and I can project the thing that everybody thinks awesome. So we can avoid ourselves. I don't like who I really am. We can adapt ourselves. I don't really like who I am, so let me put on um, a, a false self so people will look at me and they'll think I'm strong and they'll think I've got it all put together and they'll think I'm the kind of guy that everybody thinks I should be or the kind of gal everybody thinks I should be. Right, This is a game that we play. And then probably the most 
uh, the, the most popular today and the most devastating is accept yourself. Now, accept yourself, I, I understand what we're trying to do in, in regards to anthropology, but, but accept yourself is going to go in one of two ways. Um, on the far end of accept yourself is mental illness. On the far end of accept yourself is mental illness. Um, I, I'm not meaning this to be funny, I'm meaning it, uh, I want it to break your heart, that there's a 20-year-old girl that thinks she's a cat, She, it was revealed to her when she was a little girl that she's not human at all, that she's a cat. And so she hisses at dogs. She crawls on all fours. Laps water out of a dish. She's mentally ill. And no one can tell her that anymore. Why? because she's just accepted herself. So that's the far end. That's not how it plays out for most of us, right? And so I'm, I'm trying to draw the, for, for most of us, accept ourselves mean this is just who I am. It, it is most often used as a justifier to stay stuck where we are, right? And so I'm, I'm gonna plead with us today, uh, and I'm gonna have to speed this up. Uh, I'm gonna plead with us today to do none of those things, but rather to accept the grace of God. That's, that's how I'm going to argue. Now, now, why would I argue that way? Well, turn to James 1. Hopefully, you're already there. And I'm going to actually read from my Bible. All right? So this is James chapter 1. We're going to pick it up in verse 23. The context of this passage is that James is arguing about hearing the word and doing the word and the distance between the two and the damage that occurs when there is distance between the two. Now, look right at me so we can all breathe out. Everyone in this room has some distance between what they have heard from the word and what they are actively living out in the word. Amen? No one's nailing this right now. Like no one can right now just go, yeah, I'm just going to turn this off. I got gotcha. you. Right? So let's, let's look at this passage. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Now, I'm going to ask you to do something that I think is incredibly brave. Uh, all right. In fact, I think it's so brave, it requires so much courage that most people won't do it, and the speed of our day enables you to not do it. Here's what I'm going to ask us to do. I'm going to ask us to turn and face ourselves. To turn and face ourselves. Right? To just stop for a second and be really, really honest. Because this passage is saying that, that you and I, we, we have a, um, a tendency to be spiritually not self-aware. He paints this picture of, of looking in the mirror. He actually uses the word intently. That, that means staring, gazing in the mirror. And we get a, a picture of ourselves. And so the, the word of God goes out. You hear the word of God. And as the word of God's preached, you kind of really quickly kind of gaze. Yeah, I'm nailing that. I'm doing well. And, and then you walk away. And, and it doesn't take you long to completely forget who you actually are. That This passage is a lot about justification. That, that you and I lack spiritual self-awareness because of what we're staring intently at. So, so the problem with this whole thing is that people end up um, kind of thinking more highly of themselves than they ought to or thinking more lowly of themselves than they ought to. Both of these are devastating to the human soul and, and not what God intends. So, so you have those who kind of elevate themselves, you know, like narcissistic tendencies, and then you've got the ones that are so broken that God could never use them. So you've got a guy up here wearing a cape, even though bullets kill him, and you've got uh, the person down here thinking they're worthless despite the fact that Jesus saved them. And James is saying, this is about what you're staring at. This is about the mirror that you're looking in. And so let, let's look at this little phrase. Um, James says here, but, so that's a good news. We don't want to be like those who forget what we look like. He says, but 
The one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So when James talks about the law of liberty, what he's talking about is the gospel. Right? Paul uses this same kind of imagery in Romans 3, 27, where he calls it the law of faith. He's saying it's no longer a law if you got to do these things and not do these things. He's like, gaze upon the law of liberty and be shaped and transformed by it. Now, when I got married and would go shopping with Lauren, it lists straight up. I'm not a shopper. Like, I'm in. I know what I want. I'm grabbing it. I'm going home. I don't need to go to mold. I had to, we went to a daddy daughter dance last night, Nora and I did, and I went to try to find her address, and I was just like, be a good dad, be a good dad, be a good dad. It looks beautiful, baby. No, okay, back to the other store. Okay, let's go back to the other. All right, God, this is gonna be on her husband one day. Do your deal, get her ready, get her out. And, 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 and so, like, I, I hate it. I mean, I just hate it. So, Lauren doesn't even want me to go with her anymore. She'll be like, just stay at home. I'm like, well, I wanna spend time with you. She's like, it just stresses me out that you're there. I'm just like, well, I'm, not, I'm there. I'm not doing anything. She's like, yeah, it just feels like you're, you're just there waiting for me to finish, and I don't want to be rushed. I'm like, I'm not rushing you. And then I'm like, wait, why am I arguing? You know what, baby, go on. All right, I'm fine. And, and so but what I learned when I got married is there are, there are certain mirrors and there's certain lighting that affects how you see yourself. Right? And, and that when you shop, apparently, those mirrors and that lighting in those stores, that, that's your ideal self, yo. I mean, that is you as best as you're going to get, which is why you, you get something, you take it home, you put it on front of your mirror, and then we have to hear you go, oh, I don't like it. <laughs> and, and so the good thing about the law of liberty and gazing intently at the law of liberty is there's no mirror and light show. It's telling you the truth. When you gaze into the gospel of Jesus Christ and this gap between hearing and doing, you see you. The word of God tells you who God is and it tells you who you are. So you don't have to kind of go family of order. You don't have to go, I'm worthless or I'm amazing. You get to stare into the law of liberty and be shaped and molded and formed. Now, here's why. I love how honest the Bible is because he says that we'll stare into the law of liberty and persevere. Why? Here, look at me. I love you because man, Sometimes when you look into the law of liberty, you're not going to like what you see. You're just not going to like what you see. Like when you really see who God is and you really see who you are, God, that gets gross, man. Now, the game we like to play is to compare ourselves to another human. How easy is that when the Bible says all humans are broken? But, but when you gaze in the law of liberty, when you're reading the word of God and you see the might and power of God and you see passages like Colossians that show you the ugliness of your heart. And I don't even know if it happened to you, but in that little list in uh, Colossians, my guess is you went to the worst ones and said, that's not me. But I'm wondering how content you are with the life that God's given you. Because if you're not, that's actually called covetousness. Like when you look at somebody else's life and you think you deserve that or you wish your life was easy like theirs or you wish their mar your marriage was like theirs or their kids were like, that's covetous. That's, that's an accusation against God. That's ugly. But we blow through. We don't like that kind of self-awareness. How easy is it just to pretend but gazing into the law of liberty, gazing into the beauty of the gospel, letting the word of God bear its weight on you, that's painful. So why do we keep coming back? Why must we persevere? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because I want to try to answer it. Um, I used this illustration <clears throat> um, several years ago. It, I can't think of a better one. Uh, Lauren and I and the kids were in Northern Ireland. I was doing some teaching up there. Um, and on the north coast of Ireland, uh, the beaches aren't sand, they're rock. Um, not jagged rocks, actually really smooth black and gray rock. And what you can find mingled in that is what's called sea glass. Um, and sea glass uh, are jagged, sharp pieces of glass that went into the sea, I mean, hundreds of years ago or, or more, and, and the sea, over a period of time, has smoothed it into what looks like a river rock. And they're various colors, and I, and I should have grabbed a, a picture, but, but, but gazing into the law of liberty is like being a jagged piece of glass in the ocean. You feel like you're drowning, and yet it's shaping 
You feel like you're exposed and, and yet it's smoothing. And so we keep coming back because what we're met with on that day where we see just how ugly we are is not condemnation, but grace. And this is how, like if I could ever convince you that this is how you're transformed and this is how you learn who you are. This is how you learn who you are and learning who you are, learning who you are as yourself by gazing into the law of liberty makes you almost impervious to the pain of rejection and judgment. I'm not saying it still doesn't sting, but I'm saying it certainly won't make the floor drop out. So, so by gazing in the law of liberty, I, I feel like I am well aware of my weaknesses. Like I, I think, and, and if I'm not self-aware, then there's some brothers that are in my inner circle that I've got some contempt for. I have invited critique into my life. I've invited those brothers who see me day in and day out um, to let me know when there's an inconsistency from my mouth, uh, from the stage to my life. I feel like I'm self-aware. And in that self-awareness, I can be really honest about where I fall short and where I need to grow and where the Lord is working on me. I don't want to turn away from that. I want to stare at it. And I want it to hurt me and I want to lay it at the feet of Jesus. I want to receive his grace and let him shape me over time. Because my sharp edges at 45 are not the sharp edges I had at 25. And my guess is my sharp edges at 55 won't be my sharp edges now. And because I have been met over and over and over again with the compassion of God in my jagged edges... I've been transformed over a long period of time. Now, would I have liked um, for him to speed that process up? Yes. Am I still a little frustrated that I'm still here? Yes. Like they, there are, and, and maybe you can't relate to this at all. Maybe this is just me, but there are things that I thought were dead in me and were back there when I was 25 that every once in a while will rear their heads now at 45. And I'm like, are you serious, Lord, still? Our tendency is to want to turn away from the law of liberty and to avoid the self or to adapt the self. Not that I am beloved by God, bought with his blood a son or daughter of the king of the universe. And I'm falling short. I've got some crispy edges. And people experience me a kind of way. I'm not impeccable, nor am I infallible, but I am beloved and my self, my true self, my um, autonomous, only one of me self is Matt Chandler and all his unique background, all his giftings and all his shortcomings, beloved, bought by the blood of Jesus, secure forever. And in that moment, I can agree with the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8. If God is for me, who can be against me? Right? If God is for me, who can be against me? Like who... Who could judge me? God justifies. Who could condemn me? God justifies. It doesn't mean I'm perfect. It means he's perfect and I'm his and I'm in him. And, and this is how we see and understand our true self. Our love for ourself is not formed by gazing at our awesomeness. Our love for self is formed by the affections of God, of Christ, meeting us in our weaknesses over and over and over and over again. And the man and woman who perseveres by looking intently into the law of liberty loves themselves in a way that isn't avoiding, isn't adapting, isn't accepting because God's not done working on me. So why would I ever accept who I am right now? I am not arrived. I'm not accepting this version of Matt Chandler. Christ is an inexhaustible well. If he's done with me, then I want out. Like if this is the best I get, I want to go home. And I deeply love my wife and my family. I deeply love serving Christ with you. But if this is it, if I've reached my apex, then get me out of here. Too much pain, too much brokenness, too much hurt. Suck me out of here. But he's not. He's still at work in the mess that is me. And I'm not condemning myself in that. I'm leaning into the grace of God. And that's how you find your authentic self. And, and brothers, if you would do this, look right at me, husbands especially. If you would do this, you wouldn't ask your wife to save you. Ladies, if you could do this, you wouldn't, you wouldn't hope that, that your husband can save you. Parents, if you do this, you, you can 
cling to Christ in the dark night of the soul. Brothers and sisters, you won't take things personal that aren't personal. There's a security that can be found in gazing into the law of liberty. Now, let me tie this now to this kind of 10-year vision we have. So so I'm going to throw this on the screen. This is who we're trying to become over the course of the next 10 years. We are a welcoming home to over 8,000 people. That's not 8,000 members, right? That's 8,000 people that are seeking. So, So that's a mixture of mature, immature Christian, non-Christian, it's just what we think God is going to gather here. We are a welcoming home to over 8,000 people seeking Jesus Christ and growing in the grace of the gospel. With all our efforts wholly dependent on God, we make disciples across all ages. Every stage of life has a portion in the church. Now, how is that possible if our church is filled with unaware people who think more highly of themselves or more lowly than themselves? Narcissists don't attract people to the beauty of Christ, nor do those who think they're so worthless that God can't use them. So how how does God bring us both to where we should be? If he hates the proud and exalts the lowly, the proud needs to look into the law of liberty and see, oh no, I'm not all that I think I am, and come back down to humility, and those who are so devastated by their background or current struggle need to have their face lifted up by the king of glory and go, no, I see you, I love you, I'm for you, stand up. Right? We we can't get here without this. We celebrate 300 baptisms every year. We are a safe place for the broken and suffering to come and receive hope and care. We demonstrate the ministry of presence as we rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn again. The narcissist can't feel anything for anybody else but themselves. And the broken, weary, I'm terrible person will think they have nothing to offer. So we gaze in the law of liberty. Do you remember the woman caught in adultery and they're there ready to kill her and, and Jesus gets rid of the crowd in, in only like, like one of the cooler Jesus ways? And then what does he do? He picks up her face. I've always thought that. Like, read the text. He, he like picks up her face like she's sobbing, snot, disgrace. She's looking at him. He picks up her face. Has no one condemned you? Neither do I. Go and sin no more. Right, so, so I'm too broken, I struggle too much, I don't have anything to offer. Gosh, I wish you'd get over yourself. That's the, re- the real problem is you see yourself the, the way that the world's telling you to see yourself and not the way the good book's telling you how to see yourself. Amen. Right? We send disciples into their homes, into neighborhoods, into our city and into the nations. We, we have planted and revitalized 30 churches and have 100 missionary units on the field among 10 unreached people groups. We have seen more than 50,000 disciples rise from our campuses, church plants, revitalization efforts, and missionaries. This doesn't happen if your God is comfort, like the narcissist, and this doesn't happen if your God is fear. You see how much seeing ourselves rightly matters? Now, what, what do we do then? So I'm going to ask you to do two things. Um, here's the first one. An honest assessment of yourself. An honest assessment of yourself. What happens when we get a hint of our weakness is we tend to turn our head real quick. We like whip that head around. So if we see that, that I'm inconsistent... We, we very quickly want to numb that and get away from it. Um, if we're stuck in that terrible, I mean, the worst place in the world for you to be is that space in between kind of knowing about Jesus and fully surrendering to him. Like, that's just a life-sucking, terrible place to be. And so when you realize that's where you are, oh, I'm kind of a half-hearted creature. You know, I go to church on Sunday morning because it kind of keeps the spouse off my back, and I kind of understand some things about Jesus, but you know nothing of the delight of full surrender. So you jerk your head away real quick. Don't want to think about that. Don't want to get, like, hurry up. We've got some plans this afternoon. Don't want to think about this too much, right? So, so I'm going to ask you, don't do that. Turn and face yourself. I know it's scary. I know it's scary to honestly look at what the Bible says is true about you, and that is that you have fallen short of the glory of God. That we have all gone astray. That our righteousness is but filthy rags before him. So an honest assessment. In the James passage, he says the assessment can be made by looking at the gap between hearing and doing. So if you want a a self-assessment, 
Where's the gap between hearing and doing? This is what I know to be true. I know this is what God's called me to. I know this is the life he's invited me into, and this is what I'm actually doing. And the Bible just says, stare at that. But not stare at that for self-condemnation, but stare at that so you can marvel at his grace and love. So I'm asking you, do an honest self-assessment, and then uh, I'm gonna ask you this. Look right at me. And then do it again. And then do it again. And persevere in gazing into the law of liberty. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your grace and mercy. I thank you that as scary as it is, you know all that's broken in us. You know all that falls short in us. You simultaneously demand of us a pursuit of holiness while providing positional holiness for us. So I, so I pray we, we don't make light of what it means to be shaped in holiness, active holiness in our day in, day in lives. That, that's not a secondary issue. That, that's right up there, that we would fully surrender to you, that we would fully surrender our full lives to you, our money, our time, our energy, that we would be shaped in a profound and powerful way by these realities. And so I pray that you grant us courage to just stare at it this morning. We wouldn't rush out of it. We just stare, just reveal it. Holy Spirit, just pray right now in the hearts and minds of men and women. Would you call up to that prefrontal cortex the gap? The things that we've learned to mimic, the ways that we've learned to speak and behave while not actually experiencing those things in our hearts where we have avoided our true self, where we have um, used um, accepting ourselves as um, a, a justification of staying where we are. And I think, Father, of those brothers and sisters that would think, this is just how I am. I'm just not good at reading, and so we avoid the Bible. I'm not good at praying, so we don't pray. Uh, I'm, I'm too anxious to share the gospel with a friend or family member, and, and so we, uh, I'm thinking of my brothers and sisters who self-justify with this and just pray that you reveal that this morning. And I pray as you bring that to our mind, we would feel the power of your love wash over us and that you would shrink the gap You just shrink the gap, one little baby step of obedience at at a time, you would shrink the gap. Holy Spirit, you'll need to empower this. You'll need to awaken us. I I just have to believe the enemy would be at play to twist things that have been said, to use some of these things for people um, to condemn themselves. And I just pray against that. I thank you that Romans says, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Help us, we need you. It's for your beautiful name I pray, amen.